This week's episode of The Voice Party is brought to you by Big Boy Raps. Get your car wrapped by some of the most experienced and skilled in the Bay. Big Boy Raps, where the big boys play. Ladies and gentlemen, listeners all around the world, I'd like to personally invite you to the greatest party known to mankind. It is <laughs> The Voice Party. Ooh. I, Joaquin Xavier, accompanied by J.D., Phil Spooner, and our wonderful guest, please introduce yourself first time in front of the cameras. Not your first time on the show. No. Uh, my name is Butch Escobar. Very funny comedian. I, I, I don't know if you guys have come out to show us or seen him perform. I think you have. I think you both have. Probably, yeah. Yeah. I got to say, like I told you before, and I always say that, you're probably tired of hearing me saying this shit, but you're one of my favorite like, comedians, yeah, that's, man. Uh, you're the only guy in the world. I think. <laughs> 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 nah, man. Like seriously, I've I've I'm, I've seen you like I don't know how many times, and every time, dude, you fucking smash. Thanks. And uh, yeah, fucking. I hope to see you in a Netflix special of your own. In my, you know. I used to say I hope to see myself too, but yeah. that's a scary prospect. It's Why? Too much commitment. Oh. It's like now that I've realized how much things cost. Yeah. And the whole like, <laughs> le- like I did a, um, I did a special that was supposed to be pitched to like Showtime or Netflix. Oh wow! And a friend of mine had had me on it, a very prominent comedian, mm-hmm. and he asked me to be on it, and he had me stay with him at his house in L.A. while we were filming it, and. I've never been nervous for comedy, really. Like, since my third year maybe doing it, I haven't had anxiety attacks or anything backstage. It's usually just like, let's go do this. And I'm hearing him um, argue with somebody on the phone in the morning. It it wakes me up. He's yelling at some guy on the phone. And he's like, I spent $25,000 of my own money on this project. And all of a sudden, it hit me like... And then, like, the night before, he was like, look, bro, you're the middle part of this special. (laughs) Meaning, like, you're, like, you know, when it comes to TV specials, that's the hinge. That's the most important part other than the guy closing. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, the guy in the middle is the most important part. And then the next morning, I hear him say that he dropped, like, 25,000 of his own money into it, and he's my friend. Yeah. And all of a sudden, I'm like, this isn't a game anymore. This isn't... This isn't for fun. This isn't for, like playing around and like you know i'll we'll see if i'm good or i'm i think i'm better than that guy or like no none of that you have to be better than those guys you have to be the best you could be you have there are people's money on the line Mm -hmm. and so it freaked me out man like it freaked me out that whole day i was like nervous i was you know i went one of the things to soothe my was this recent no this is like a year and a half ago oh wow and it fucked me up because it was like, dude, I love what I do, hmm. but I don't know if I ever, like, it made me not want to be famous. It made me not want to be, um, like, uh, known? like well known, well known huh. because it's like, oh, you people are putting your money into me. And it's like, I'll I, like, you feel that pressure that you don't I feel want. that pressure. Even like when I come to like, look at this beautiful setup you guys have and it's like what are you wasting your time here like i didn't take this seriously enough <laughs> i didn't i didn't do good enough you know like i just and like maybe i am and um but man like I, that's crazy i've never heard that because yeah. he's usually with comics a lot of comics that i know is opposite like nah, i want you know but like it, you think it, you want it you think you want i it. think you think you want it and then when you realize the gravity of the situation it scares the fuck out of you it is true what they say, confidence is key. Confidence is very key. And I thought I had confidence until I realized, like, what it, you know, because I think a lot of us play the imposter syndrome game, you know, where yeah. we have, we think, 
you no matter how many people tell you you're good at what you do no matter how you in your own mind you're like i'm not that good my girlfriend cracks up because she's like you know like i told her one time i'm like i don't i i think everybody's lying to me Wow. In like 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 secretly in the back of my head, like, like they're just being nice to you because they love you. Well, my mom always told me I was a handsome g- boy and I was very smart, and we both know that those <laughs> both things are lies. They're fucking lies. She's a fucking liar. <laughs> <laughs> and so, when, when, you know, so you go forward into the world thinking like the person who loved me the most lied to me the worst. How much people? How much are other people? <laughs> and my girlfriend's like, "Wait a minute! You think you made it as far as you've made it with everybody lying? Everybody just feels so sorry for you that they just give you things so that they can't. They don't have to tell you you suck." Right, like your entire audience that comes in and pays tickets to see you yes. is just doing that to be nice. Yeah, it's so hard people to that fathom. Don't even know you were like, you know what? Like he's such a nice guy. We don't want to disappoint him, so we'll just go out and support him. Right. That's honestly <laughs> like, like, like yes. Ninety percent of my brain goes, "That's there's no way that's fucking true." If I heard if I heard any of you guys say that. I would be like, you're full of shit. You have a great podcast. I love your podcast. Mm. And if I heard JD say, I think my friends just listen to my podcast. I think my listeners just listen to my podcast because they want to make me feel better about myself. I'd slap him. Right. I'd <laughs> slap him right across the face. And I'd be I like, are you fucking crazy? I think that's true to a certain extent, I'm, though, to be honest. <laughs> that's the scene. Exactly. <laughs> Prepare for the Hold slap. On. But I have, I have something that I want to, like, on what you're I mean, saying. I think there's a lot of things you can fake. You can't fake funny, man. No. And you were genuinely fucking funny. And when I was doing comedy, when I started, and I thought, oh, man, I'm going to be good at this. Then I saw you, like, oh, I thought I was confident. <laughs> right. Then I saw you, I thought I was funny. And like, oh, fuck. Like, this dude went 20 minutes talking about something this fucking front guy said. And you just did. I think I mentioned this the last time we were, you were on the show. You talked about, like... Um, like coming on <laughs> shitting on a girl's chest off of something some guy <laughs> said in the front row and it was just like what the hell like what show is this at this was at Bex when Johan at and the I Bex okay at show. the Bex yeah. show okay and um I don't know I think it's crazy to hear that you know like the way you say it you know but it's crazy to, for me to hear that after seeing you perform at these shows like you know at the improv when it was like pretty packed and at these other shows where everyone else bombed except for you right and to hear that like holy shit well the thing is i have is no is hope <laughs> i don't deny i don't deny that i'm funny oh okay, okay i just deny that i'm that funny like i go i know i'm fucking like because uh, that's the thing is a lot of my funny comes from just fly on the fly yeah, like yeah. i yeah. like you said i see something in the audience and i go um we, you know what do you like i'll start talking to them and i'll start digging in and then i'll start like and then i'll make it an everybody thing and we're all like talking about the same i like audience interaction for mm-hmm. sure and i like when an audience i like what i try to do is i don't um ever i always tell my audience hey you're gonna get a one-of-a-kind show tonight no matter what mm-hmm. there'll be some jokes that were the same at the last thing but a lot of what we talk about is just what we talk about and You're building because, an intimate experience. Right, because I know that I'm funny there. When I'm just coming off the top of my head, I know that I'm funny. But I also know that I miss. Right. It's not 100%. I can't just conjure up this beast that just starts fucking saying funny shit at the top of his head. 99% of the time, I can. And the 1% that I can't, I save my material for that. Yeah. But I don't think my material is funny. Everybody else may think that it's funny, but I don't think it's funny. Mm. And so as I rip through stuff and then all of a sudden I come upon a brain block or whatever, I'll go into material and then I'll feed off the material. I'll feed off a reaction in the crowd and then I go back into yeah. um, doing that. But my fear is, is that one day that's just going to shut down. Uh, and what am I going to do when that shuts down? Mm. I can't just rely on material because I'm not a material comedian. Right. I like it's funny because I have material comedians come up to me, which is the 99% of the comedians out there. Yeah. And they'll go, I can't. You know, I wish I could do what you do. Like I like how just, you know, like I had a comic who's probably been working on the same material for like the last couple of years. Mm. And rightly so, when you're in that, if you're at Bill Burr level, you should be coming up with an hour special every year. Yep. You should be coming up with an hour. But if you're at the, the level that I'm at or that you guys are at, 
your material is not going to manifest for quite some time. You're going to be working on the same material for yeah. two, three, four years at a time. You're going to have the same jokes. And so when, you know, and I envy dudes like that because yeah. you know what you're going to say. You know what you're going to do. You know that it, that there's a probability of it hitting. For me, I go, I think this is funny. I don't know how I'm going to word it when I get up there. And I'm just going to talk. And hopefully they like it. And they end up liking it most of the time. You know, yeah, I'll admit that there are, there are um, 99% of the time it's effective, you know, that I'm, I go against my own general wisdom of thinking that it won't be, and it is. But, th and I think that's what drives us to be better, and I think that's what makes me maybe a better comic all the time, Yeah, is that I, in the back of my mind, go, I'm not a good comic. I'm not good enough. This is not good enough. I need to try hard. This is the only bread and butter that I have. If these people find out that I'm not real mm. then they're gonna then i won't have any job i won't have anything so in a way it's like the same way that i uh that i get my um my welfare i lie about most of my <laughs> <laughs> most of my existence so i could get money you know what i mean that's how i feel yeah. i hustle my welfare form just like i hustle my fucking comedy <laughs> like neither are real neither are they. like but i gotta lie and say i'm homeless and that i only make so much money a year and like you know because the bear is expensive you know oh, yeah. like Fuck, yeah so you gotta have two drug two jobs sell drugs <laughs> and have a hit youtube show to survive right yeah and you gotta and, and like <laughs> And then at the same time, you got to hustle fucking general assistance and welfare. Yep. Yeah. You know, and like, that's Jeez. the thing is like, I feel that's the same way with comedy is like, I have to pretend that I'm famous. I have to pretend that I, like, I'll, I post stuff all the time on my social media. We're like, hey guys, come out to the show and yeah. come and enjoy. And in my mind, I'm like, please don't come out and realize that I suck. <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> you know dude, this, what this is reminding me of, uh, you know Henry Rollins? Uh, the, the, when he, oh, I love Henry Rollins. When he was uh, the lead singer of Black, Black Flag, they opened for Ozzy when Ozzy was touring on his, on his own name. And, um, he said that he went backstage after finishing, you know, doing the show, and and Ozzy is like, "Is anyone out there?" And he's like, "What do you mean, is anyone out there?" He's like, I, I I worry about it every show. He's like, "You're fucking Ozzy." He's like, "I know, but I get so depressed. I don't think they're gonna." Yeah. Come. Yes. Like, oh. You would never think that Ozzy thought that. I Just can. the same. I mean, you know, I never would. Johnny imagine. Carson used to pace between his his green room and the guest green room. Holy. He shit. would make sure the doors were open so he could like travel back and forth and many a comics have like i read this one it was um i can't remember who it was but he was a guest on the johnny carson show and he sees him pacing back and forth he goes he leans over to the producer and he goes what's up with this guy is he ready to do the show or what you know and he goes he does this every show he oh, does wow. this every show he just freaks out and it's like you're johnny carson you get up nightly yeah and i think that's the thing though i think that's the thing that drives you Right. To be better than what you are is that if you do, I, I, I'm not going to name any names, but I know comics in the Bay Area that go, my jokes are good enough mm. and I just need to be discovered. Yeah. And I watch those people just spin their tires in mud and I go, you know, and I watch that person and, and, and you go, they go, I'm funny, I'm good. You know, and it's like, yeah, you got a couple funny jokes, but if you're not constantly making your jokes better, if you're const not constantly making your material better, then you are going to sit there and spin your wheels, and you are going to wait for discovery to happen, and it, a very good chance in the world that it's not ever going to happen if you look at it that way. Mm. But if you're constantly going like, th this part of the hill is not high enough, yeah, yeah. and you and you go, oh, I'm going to climb higher. I don't think I can do it, yeah. but I'm going to try to get there. You know, and it's that journey of a thousand miles where you keep coming up on a person every few miles. You go, how far is the town? They go, only a few miles more. And you go a few miles more, and you're exhausted, and you're tired, and you meet another person. And you go, how, how much further? And they go, oh, it's only a few miles more. And then by the end of the, the journey, you've reached a thousand miles, and, and you're like, you could look at it as like, all those fucking people lied to me. <laughs> you know what I mean? Or you could look at it as like, all those people were just pushing me to go a little bit further and yeah. a little bit further. And in the, the se this sense of the story, you are those people. You know, telling yourself, well, this is just good enough. Oh, shit. You know, this is just, uh, you know, like, okay, I can get there. You know, like, for me, it's always milestones, dude. Yeah. yeah. 
I just did a huge show uh, with the, Texas, right? Yeah, in Texas in El Paso with uh, Felipe Esparza. Nice. And you know, everybody was really happy for me, and I'm I'm happy too to be there. You know, but in the back of my mind, I'm telling myself, enjoy the moment. Oh, you know, I mean, the the existentialist in me has, uh, the new existentialist in me has mm. said, enjoy your your present moments. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But know that when you go to bed, you're going to get up, you're going to board a plane, and you're going to head back to your home, and you're going to perform in the backyard of a fucking restaurant, or yeah. you're going to be doing open mics at a fucking a washing machine at a, at a what do you call it a or laundry man or do comedy in some garage yeah you're gonna yeah Maybe exactly an open uh, are you gonna podcast. do a, a podcast <laughs> 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 you know and so it's like great that was a marker that i hit yeah. i've been wanting to get on the road with that guy for a while he's a good friend of mine and Felipe? yeah he's had you on the podcast a couple of times he's had too. me on the podcast a couple of times um very generous human being probably one of the most generous people i've ever met in comedy and, um, you know, I was really happy and it was a marker for me, but it was like, cool, you got that. You got to that part of the hill. Yeah. Hmm. But that's not the top of the hill. Right. You know, this is great. I, I'm, I'm happy for people acknowledging that I did it. I'm happy. Dude, I, I'm not going to lie and say I'm, I love that people go, oh, look, you made it there. Yeah. And, and it's great to have that feeling for the moment. But I only, but when you look at the grand scheme of things, when you look at when Butch first started and go, where are you gonna go? And one day I end up on one of the most famous comics fucking podcast and then one of the most famous <coughs> comics shows on the road with him. That's so far from where I thought I was gonna be. But at the same time, you know, when you're hiking up a hill, if you've ever gone up Mission Peak or you've ever gone up a big mountain, you get halfway and you look down and you can see where your car is and it's like super tiny and you're like, I never, wow, that's Shit. so small. But then you look back up off the hill and you're only halfway. Jeez, yeah. And so that's how I look at it, you know, is like, this isn't good enough. Yeah. I'm not going to come off this hill and go home and be like, hey, dad, I made it halfway up Monument Hill, yeah. you know, or whatever hill, you know. Because some guys will get to that point, and they, ah, that's it, I made it. Shoot, I didn't even like, think I was going to make it I, this far. And, 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 like, I don't have to write new jokes. I'm funny already. I don't have to keep working on my craft. Like, no, and then they go, and a lot of guys fall under that. I think they fall under that. I've seen a few comics in the Bay where they fall under that. I'm. This is. These are good jokes. This is a good set. Yeah. I've gotten on the road with a couple of guys. And now I'm just, I just think it's a matter of time before I get discovered. And it's like, you know, one, no, that you got to like, you can't just settle for one masterpiece. Yeah. Right. You have to remake a masterpiece and remake a master. But also the one thing about comedy that I've learned is that it's relevant. It's only relevant. If it's not relevant, it's not comedy. Mm -hmm. So like, if you ever watch old Richard Pryor, Richard Pryor's the king, right? We all say he's the king, but I barely giggle when I watch his stuff. I'm not saying he wasn't good. I'm not yeah. saying he wasn't amazing, but it's the jokes time, are old. The, time, the jokes yeah. are old. I mean, like you know, and it's like I, I, for the, the time I think back, I go, man, this must have been murdering back then. Yeah, yeah. But just like you take any beast now, and uh, you know, and there's very few comics that are that have timeless sets now. Yeah, yeah. Because there's so much of it. Because there's too. so much, dude. You know what? I feel like a year ago was a hundred years ago. Yeah. And so with the times changing and the speed of the internet and all the information we're gathering, comedy is only relevant at this point. And if you don't keep up with your, you know, like, if you, if you don't change up your jokes, if you don't change up your, the way you're, you're thinking and, and you watch, you know, I have a friend, um, mutual friend of ours that took off to Vegas. Oh, yeah. And one of my problems with him is that I, go, I show him new stuff. Yeah. I'd show him something on YouTube, and he would go, you know, I like that stuff, bro, but <laughs> the voice. that's not for me. <laughs> you know? And I would go, okay, it's not for me either. Yeah. 
You know, like when I first started watching YouTube, it was fucking how to fix my brakes and my stuff. Right, right. Yeah. But I would watch these, I'd watch H3, or I'd watch Casey Neistat, or I'd watch, you know, and I would watch PewDiePie, and I didn't get why anybody liked PewDiePie. Yeah. And now I watch H3 religiously. I fucking love PewDiePie. It took me a minute to adjust, but I forced myself to watch a part of to watch a part of a genre that I wasn't involved with. Right. Hmm. But also drives the business that I'm that I'm in. Yeah. Young people, twenty to forty years old, um, and mostly in their twenties watch comedy. Yep. Okay? So if I'm not reading if I'm not up to par with um the new memes and the new things that people are watching TikTok, and the new I'm trends and t TikTok's another one. Yeah. TikTok, you know what? Comic. When I first started doing YouTube, comics would go, <clears throat> "Oh, here's Mr. YouTube," and they would make fun of me. Joe Gorman used to fucking make fun of me all the time. He'd be like, "Here's Mr. YouTube," and I know nobody knows who Joe Gorman is, but I'm calling him out because now I see motherfuckers trying to get on YouTube and try to put their shit up there. Yeah. <laughs> and that was me and Ian Kung were one of the only comics in the Bay Area. Yeah. Putting up shit on YouTube, like skits and stuff like that. Some guys were putting their sets up, but most people were just kind of like, so how's the YouTube thing going? And then after a while, it was like they were getting into it. And then all of a sudden, I was getting made fun of for being on TikTok. And then now motherfuckers are on TikTok. Everybody, yes, that's now. how you blow up. I mean, shoot, we need we're we're filming now. We need to like look for some TikTok book of clips. <laughs> yeah, because yeah. there's been that's some hilarious sketches on TikTok. <laughs> Like have me rolling, yeah. rolling, and, and especially now that like comics are doing it, like comics are are, are starting their TikToks. It, it, how do you feel? How do you feel like that's, um, like TikTok for for instance? Do you say you have one now? Yeah, fuck yeah. Okay, because I know I was point, one of the first comics in the Bay to get on TikTok. Wow. Uh, like maybe Mark Smalls and a few guys were before me. Yeah. But I, I, but and then I was also one of the first ones to throw up sketches on TikTok and not just my stand up. Yeah. Smart. Because yeah. I knew, like, here's the thing, man. When you talk to guys your age, because you guys are younger than me, mm -hmm. you grew up watching YouTube. Yeah. Right? You, I, I thought of it as a, as a TV network, kind of. You weren't watching Saturday morning cartoons, um, right? At the I, very end of it. Well, At I, the very end yeah, of it. I, I'm, I'm, I was born in 86. Okay. So cartoons were, like, Saturday morning cartoons were definitely part of my makeup. YouTube didn't come out until I was in high school. Okay. But that was sort of my college entertainment. That, you know yeah, I mean? like, that's how I had that weird transition, too, because I grew up like, with only having TV. Like the, I don't know if you're familiar with Doug Walker, the nostalgia critic, but I'm basically the, the crowd he, or the oh, angry yeah. video game nerd, I'm the crowd that he's aiming at, because all the, the classic, uh, movies and cartoons, <clears throat> X-Men animated series, whatever, the classic video games, the Marios, the songs. Right. That's stuff that I grew up playing. So I'm definitely a part of the YouTube generation, but I'm I'm older. You know? Yeah, okay, so then maybe a few years before you guys or t another decade, like kids from the 90s, kids that were born in the 90s. Mm -hmm. Right here. You know, and that's 90s. the thing is like, like we're talking about PewDiePie. Yeah. That's where I, because I was talking to someone who was younger and they were like, I grew up watching PewDiePie. Now PewDiePie. What is that? P you don't he's know a YouTuber. P he's a oh, YouTuber. Okay. He's the biggest YouTuber in the world. He's like a video game guy, right? Uh, he was a video game guy, and he makes fun of video games, and he still plays video games, but he does a lot of different other content. Mm. But the thing is, is it doesn't even matter anymore because yeah. he had a generation of kids growing up with him, so his money's in the bank already. Yeah. He's always going to get so many people that watch him because there are so many people that grew up with him. You know, like, that's the way I look at it is like, when I'm on TikTok, I understand that there are definitely people my age and maybe younger watching what I'm doing. Yeah. But also, I'm hoping that they're like 15-year-old kids yeah. that go, bro, I watch that guy on TikTok. And so if you're, crazy. if you're not getting into those, and that's the thing is you're talking about what you were into, you watch this guy, Nostalgia. And the Nostalgia Critic. The yeah. Nostalgia Critic. Who's a big show now. Now, for me, my brain has completely rejected nostalgia because nostalgia will weaken me i feel like like mm. for me not for you not for anybody else but for me as a comic as far as relevance like goes. Yeah. like it's funny because i'll go to my girlfriend's house and her son's playing um pixel games he's playing fucking um platformers and fucking classics and i go 
There's so much better shit now. <laughs> what the fuck are you doing? Better. He, yeah. And he lo- right, exactly, yeah. exactly. And we have that argument where I go, there's so much better shit. And he goes, that's better to you. You know, and he's playing Shovel Knight and, and games that are kind of new, but... Yeah. I mean, I know, but they look like Shovel Knight looks like old Castlevania to me. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. and they love that stuff. And for me, I love like what's the newest graphic? I want like Unreal Engine shit at this point. I, yeah. You know, like I was disappointed by fucking Cyberpunk. You know, like <laughs> like I, I want I want as real as I can get. I, I want like. You know, um, I want the explosions to feel real. I want the bullets to feel real. I want the, like, you know, um, I want the action to be as palpable as possible mm. in the, from a video game. And, and that is simply because when I'm talking, now it's habit and I love it, but, but, but it's like... You Did know, you when force I force yourself into that, I don't want to walk into a room of people and go, "Who's playing Mario 3D right now?" And everybody's like, "That's not what we're fucking playing," you know? Like, yeah. <laughs> you, you I mean, well, that that I think that is a interesting thing about Nintendo is that they've been able to keep the same characters. Yes. They're banking yes. 30, 40 years. They're banking on nostalgia. Technology. They're banking. On like nostalgia. I saw their yeah. new releases. What was yeah. it? What is it called when Nintendo puts out um? Like a sizzle reel, um, uh, like um, a Nintendo Presents or some shit yeah. like that. Oh, yeah. I watched one with another podcast that I was on, and I was like, these are old fucking games. Like, and that's the thing is that I'm glad there's a, a group of people that pick up on it, but my my audience is I want it to always be younger people. Right. Mm-hmm. I want my, like, if you go onto my Twitch channel, my audience is high school to college kids. Oh, wow. Right, you know, and we're talking about mental health, and we're talking about depression and anxiety, and we're talking about the things that kids are talking about. My generation doesn't even know what depression and anxiety is. That's sadness and worrying. Yeah. Get the fuck out of here. The man, t- is it like the man well, up generation where they just say, "Yeah, no. mine's the man up. Do a snort of coke and drink a beer and get the fuck back to work." I you mean, know, I, well, you know, I th- well, I mean, it was definitely the man up mentality was definitely a majority, but I mean, it's not like people were entirely ignorant of. Of depression and anxiety before this new generation. Sure. I mean, The Sopranos was a thing before that generation. Yes. The whole crux of the show was this mobster is struggling with depression and anxiety. So yes, yeah. yes. And that's like early '90s. Right. And that's yeah. my generation of men that raised me. You know, my grandfather definitely had a hard time saying "I love you" to my father. My dad had an easier time saying it, but my dad also had a hard time dealing with me crying. My father didn't like when I would cry or get upset or feel emotional, Hmm. you know? And now, like, I am an adult knowing the mistakes that my father made, and my father was a good father, but when my son cries, I don't look at him and go, what are you, what are you, what are you doing? Why are you behaving that way? Why are you, you know, like, I go, hey, it's okay to feel how you're feeling. Yeah. You know, and like, and and I'm a rough guy. I'm a t- bro. I I before I did comedy, I was a, bar- a bouncer at a bar and a bartender at a dive bar, at a biker punk rocker bar. Yeah. You know, I got in fights every single day. Like fucking, you know. I mean, and I've always seen you as a gentle giant. Yeah, and I wasn't before. Yeah, I was right. a fucking monster. Yeah. But you know, I had a kid, and I go, I don't want him to be anything like me. Where I think a lot of Chicano males. Yeah will go, dude, this is my mini-me. Hey, bro, you got to behave like this. Men act like this. Men do this. And I've got to define manhood for you. I'm going to let my son define manhood for himself. Right. Just like I decided to define manhood for myself. What I learned later on is winning fights and drinking as much as you can, drinking friends on the table and doing as many drugs and fucking looking cool is not about being a man. Mm. That's, That's a construct that we built in our American society. Right. I, I I would say that like being able to defend yourself is definitely for sure. Like and defend your loved ones. Uh, uh, defending loved ones. Those yeah. are th- there are positive elements of some of those more sure. Not to use a buzzword, but toxic. Yes. Elements of of what people perceive to be like being manly men. Like not necessarily picking a fight being manly, but being able to stick up for yourself and yo, there's something about get off me, bro. And it's you gotta be that way. Yeah. yeah. That's in nature so, in general. Like, you know, I mean, that's like something that's just in us, but like, uh, right. when it comes to that, that you be able to like see what, what, what trips me out about that is like, 
when you know our little ones grow up right and what we didn't even think about <laughs> was what we were trying to protect them from is what eventually you know they well that's the thing is what are you perfect protecting them from right i got in a fist fight at the beginning of the pandemic and i haven't really? been in a fist fight in years oh, wow. like years mm. and i claim to be a pacifist and i consider myself still a pacifist and it was hard for me to wrap my head around what happened but, you know, um, I'm dropping my son off, getting ready to drop him off with his mom's, and we meet halfway. I get along really good with his mom, but she lives in Salinas. So we meet in San Jose, which is a halfway point. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm waiting for him, and we got the car backed into the parking thing, and we're watching an altercation happen between two people who almost hit each other coming in and out of the parking lot. Mm. This lady almost hit this guy. He told her to fuck off and watch where she was going. She said, fuck you. He screeched around, came back in the parking lot, and he's at her car in her window, and he's kicking on her door. Wow. And my son's looking at me like, what would, like... My son's, my son's been through so much in his life that he don't even like get scared. But he was more like, this guy can't like you gonna let this guy do this. Time to hero up. Pop. And so I was like, hey man, leave that lady alone, bro. Get the fuck away from that. And like I'm a big dude, so I Jedi mind trick a lot of motherfuckers. Yeah. Mm. You know, and I'm, this dude was in the Tesla. He he was as big as me, but he was like a big white dumpy looking techie guy mm -hmm. so i figured i could yell at him and he would go fuck that this is too formidable of an opponent and i'm out of here yeah no he jumped in his car and he tried to run me over first Holy of all he's shit. in a tesla and he pulls up and he tries to run me over i jump out and he gets out of his car and he starts running at me and i go bro if you get any anywhere near me i'm gonna boom and i because by then he was already on me and i had my <laughs> son behind me in the car so i deliver a good i deliver a good one to him and it knocks him back, and he goes to swing again. I hit him again. Now, this isn't me bragging. Mm -hmm. This guy's probably been in zero fights or maybe one or two. I can't even count how many fights I've been in at this point. Yeah. In my, like I said, I used to bounce, and I used to... And, and in my mind, I was even telling myself, don't feel good about this. <laughs> you, you're doing what you got to do. And I'd hit him, and then he'd go to hit me, and then I'd hit him again. And I think about the fourth one, he started to buckle. And his leg, his like knees were growing knobby, yeah. And and I was giving him meter doses. Mm. I was not giving him my hard ones because right. I've knocked motherfuckers out yeah, before. Yeah. And I said, Just look at your love taps. right. And he's covered in blood. Jeez. And I go, look at yourself. You're covered in blood. You've tried to get four shots off on me, and you've gotten hit five fucking times, bro. Fuck. Like, get the fuck out of here. Get in your car and get the. He goes, I'm calling the police. I'm all. Please call the police. And he goes, I'm going to show them all. I have a car that has seven different cameras. I'm going to show them all the video of you assaulting me. I'm all, you're also going to show them that you tried to run me over and that you attacked me. And your car also has video of you kicking on that lady's car. So I suggest you get the fuck out of here, bro. And he, like, thought about it. He's dripping blood everywhere, and he just gets in his car, and he leaves. <laughs> and, and I had to talk to my son about it, and I had to tell him, like, you know, I didn't want to do that. Yeah. This is what happened. I had to defend you. I was defending you. Because I didn't know what he was going to do once he got past me. Right. You know, and, and, and this was at the beginning of the pandemic. It was like the third or fourth day of the shutdown. Wow. Mm. So tensions are high everywhere. Yeah. yeah. And, and what I realized, you know, and I, and I went through a lot of guilt. I lamented over, you know, what I did and how I felt because I'm trying to be a better human being. Yeah. And I felt like, in a, in a sense, that was me being a better human being. For sure. Because I didn't beat the fuck out of him. I didn't get, climb up on top of Stop him and pummel floor, him, which yeah. I would. I, bro, old me would have suplexed that motherfucker into the <laughs> cement, climbed on top of him, and beat him till someone pulled me off of him. For sure. And then when it's like, you see, son, son, this is why you're not strong enough to be like, dad, dad. He's right, not, yeah. He's not breathing no more. He, he, Come on. And my son's been through hell and back with my old life. Yeah. So when he saw that happening, he was like, I was like, are you, were you worried? He goes, no, I don't give a fuck. Because <laughs> you, know? you could have turned that into a bad experience. Your son was like, like, you let him live? Yeah, where you <laughs> right. just knock nice. him the fuck out, and then you tell your son, hey, when someone does this to you, you make sure you leave him. Well, and that's what I told my son. I said, look, my back was against the wall. Yeah. I had no choice but to swing. Yeah. I gave him all the room in the world to get the fuck out of here. And you let him get away. And I let him get away. And that was the thing, too, is when the cops rolled up, Oh, he did call the police. So the inside called the police. Oh, okay. And the cops broke, one of them broke away from me, went inside, came back out, and they were like, what do you want to do? And I was like, well, what do you mean what I want to do? Because I'm thinking I'm in trouble right yeah. now. Yeah. And they're like, do you want to press charges? you want us to look for the guy? Or, you know, where he's all, we're already looking for him, but if you want to press charges, you can stick around. And I'm like, 
I don't want to press charges. You know, He's and been the, punished enough. The cops were like, you know, like we saw the whole thing go down. It's, you're good. Don't worry about it. And I was like, you know, and then my son's mom pulls up and, you know, and for this her. This is San Jose? Uh, yeah, this is in San Jose. For her, it wasn't a matter of like, oh, you know, like, oh, my God, my ex-husband got in a fight with in front of my son. Yeah. For her, I was more worried about, oh, say so you're up to your old tricks again. Yeah. You know, and I was like, you know, and there was a guy there that explained to her in front of you know just he was just coming over to compliment me and be like hey man i saw what you did you did the right thing you know and like he's like man i've never seen that control in a human being and like my whole time in, in my brain was like i don't want to regret over this i don't yeah. want to hurt over this you know and so that's the thing is like i've flushed that toxic masculinity out of my body and yeah. i and that was a real good case of it and i'm very happy for myself and i don't want to pass that down to my son you know like i showed him that i had to do what i had to do but i also showed him my lament yeah. i didn't get in the car and be like you see your old man fuck somebody up yeah. like no i was like <laughs> i was like are you okay and i was like i'm not proud of myself right now i'm not happy about what happened and that's really the truth of it man if anybody's ever been in a fist fight and you know in public not a sanctioned one mm. you go home feeling like shit and bro even also, if you won you yeah. did like two three days later like you're not feeling good about yourself especially if you hitting someone as hard as you can with your fists the feeling you get from your fists hitting their face mm. you you could kill them easily you could kill someone who doesn't you fight. Fuck, easily kill somebody. Kill somebody. That's it's a scary thing that goes through your head after you punch someone as hard as you can, you know, or if you Especially go, when right. you see him fall. Yeah. Especially when that, you see him fall and you fall run and, and you don't know there's so many times in my life, bro, where I saw someone fall and my boys grabbed me and we run and I didn't know the I, I mean, I'm only assuming I didn't kill anybody because the cops haven't fucking yeah. not knocked on my door, you know, but when I was younger, bro, I was like I fucking loved fighting with people. Yeah. You know, I loved that feeling. And and when I look back, that was the thing was like, I didn't love that feeling. Yeah. I loved knowing that I could fucking handle myself because I grew up in an environment where, where how good you fight and how much you could drink was a test of your manhood. Right. So I had this false sense of what I, of pride of, of the man that I was. You know, when I look at what I've done now, traveled all over the country, all over the world, I've performed on many stages, I've gotten up and done the scariest thing that a human being could do yeah. time and time again. Um, I've raised a son who's doing okay in school. Um, I've managed to have most of my past relationships. Um, the, the person still likes me. You know, my ex-wife, I get along with great. I get along with her, her husband. So all those things tell me that all those wins, knocking motherfuckers out, getting in fights is nothing. Yeah. That's not a test of manhood. What I'm doing now, taking care of my son, you know, being good to people, mm. being being as generous as I possibly can, being considerate of others, um, turning down things like getting in a fight, right. um, not getting angry in your car when someone cuts you off, you know, not feeling cheated when you don't get the fucking role or whatever. All those things are real tests of not just your manhood, but your adulthood. Mm -hmm. You know, I yeah. firmly believe in the whole thing. Like, man, like, I used to be a very, I'm a man. Women are women. They're meek. They're small. They're tiny. Yeah. They're these little things that need to be protected. And I used to be a very um, uh, chauvinistic person in that way. Mm -hmm. And it's not because I live in Berkeley and a bunch of hippie ladies have convinced me that men and women are equal but i do believe that to say my manhood in a way is chauvinistic like be proud that you're a man be proud that you're a good man oh yeah be proud that you're a man just as much as you're proud that you're black or you're you're hispanic or you're white or whatever you want to be proud of be proud of that as much as you're proud of that but to me my manhood and my my race are very small cans on my shelf yeah. Where my being a father is a big can or my, you know, being a good man or being a good person. Yeah. So when I say be a, a man, to me now, I don't say that anymore. Be a fucking adult. Mm, yeah. Because women and men are capable of the same things almost through, except maybe physicalities. Right. We can't give birth. Right. But you can't say man up. I don't feel like I can't. I, can, I guess you can and you can, but I can't say man up anymore. 
Yeah, no. I've never actually said that. Yeah. <laughs> like, I've, I, I've I thought about that. I thought about uh, that um, when I, I would get, I had this boss who had that mentality, and, and I'm calling off today, bro. He's like, why? I have a fever. Ah, oh, man up. Like, it's crazy to think how, like, now <laughs> with a fever, yeah, no, with a pandemic. But right. back then, it was like, why, dude? I have fucking time off that the company provides. Like, why? Like, yeah. it's just to think about how, I don't know. It's, anno- man, it's annoying, bro. Be- being a man, being a, and and again, this is like, you know, I feel, <laughs> feel like I'm betraying my audience when i say stuff like this sometimes because i have a very masculine audience Mm. but at the same time i feel like i'm building bridges here when i have like soldiers and men who have been out to battle um i serve a lot of the troops in my time and and in a way i also want them to see me and go here's a masculine dude he looks masculine he acts masculine He's he d- he follows all the traits of being masculine, but he's also in touch with everything else in this world. Right. You know, and 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 in a way, it's for me, it's showing you, look, bro, this manhood thing, this whole be a man, is a construct developed by our society to make you just work harder, and 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 trick you into thinking that there's something that you need to prove to the world. Right. When in all reality, there's nothing you need to prove to the world. You're already doing it. You're doing what JD's supposed to do because you have a microphone in front of you and you got all this stuff around you. And this is a test of not just your manhood, but your adulthood. And I think that's the thing is your humanhood, what you really are as a human being. For me, you know, it's like that's, that's the way I look at it because for so long, you know, even through my own father who's a feminist who who champions women's rights in his business and mm. you know and, and his um he he stands for civil rights but even my father could only give me so much of that thought process you know because even to him like well we go hunting and we drink beer and we you know we tell fucking war stories at the table and it's like for what for what so you could feel this validity that doesn't get you anywhere in life and it's exhausting to be that way and it's exhausting to be that way but i i will say if if someone legitimately enjoys i'm i I know people who really do love hunting for sure and i like i grew up in in, oh no that's not i love it right i love hit hunting and fishing but that's not to say that makes you a man no no yeah agree like there are women that love hunting in 2021 and even before then but Right. right um I guess I'm saying, like, you know, man, woman, whatever it is that you like, you know, I, I, I guess the message here is embrace what you love regardless of what your gender is and don't let your gender define what you love, right? Yeah, and I think that's the idea we should all carry right now um, b- because, you know, the biggest example for me, man, it was like two, three years ago on Halloween, me and my nephew, who's a little older than my son, went to go look for um, a Grim Reaper costume for my son. And we looked everywhere. We finally found one, and we were walking by that ladies' store, Claire's. And my son was like, that's a cool Grim Reaper, and it was a Grim Reaper all in pink. Hmm. And and my, my nephew goes, that's for girls. And my first thought, too, was like, that's for girls. <laughs> and my son, but my nephew said it out loud, and my son says, so? And, and, and he still wanted to go look at it. And, and, and I was like, I hit my nephew and I go, yeah, so, but it showed my thinking compared to someone who's new to this world. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Who doesn't have that construct built into and them. And hey, yet. check this up. Check this out. Drop some real knowledge. I don't know if I've ever talked about this on the podcast before, but historically, pink and blue, the whole concept of blue is for boys and pink is for girls is a marketing campaign yep. developed in the 1950s yeah. by people who wanted to sell baby clothes and paraphernalia to parents. Used to be, if you go all the way back to colonial America, boys were wrapped in pink swaddling clothes. Why? Because pink is basically the downplayed uh, shade of red, and red was the color of the British Army. Right. So the idea was... I'm having a son, so I'm going to wrap him in pink because he'll eventually serve and go hold a gun. Whereas blue was the color for baby girls because it was considered calming. And after the 1950s, it flipped. And now, you know, pink is for girls and 
quote unquote sissies and then blue is for boys and right and it's it's like no it's not like i personally don't like pink but i love purple it's close enough sure <laughs> you know what i mean like, but that's the thing though is that it is it's a construct mm-hmm. and and if you start to notice those constructs cuz that's not the only one oh yeah There's you know times. like like there, there, there's one i have an example of is is when uh, a man cooks like I don't know, in Latinos is big. Like, oh, you're cooking. Where's your vieja? Where's your woman? Where's your lady? Right. But that that annoys the fuck out of me because like, what? Are you just wanting another mommy? <laughs> like, yeah. Or when girls go, oh, I'm so impressed you could cook. Yeah. You know, or like you feel that's an uh, impress because I did cook and that was my thing. Was like, yeah, I'm a man who cooks. Yeah. And it's like you should cook. You should do the exactly. laundry. Exactly. That's you an should. adult thing. You should. That's just an adult thing. Yeah. Here's the weird thing, right? For long, long, for it, I think for a very long time, like you, before you and I, any of this table was born, there's been this concept of the woman cooks, the man does not. But the the professional cooks since modern, since restaurants were a thing, were always men. Men are chefs. Always men. Yeah. You know, yeah. like, and I understand where that concept comes from when you look at like. 19 there again uh, for some reason I love the dog on 50s but 1950s America when the standard was you have your your uh, your wife and your husband the husband goes and gets the goes to work the wife stays at home with the kids and does all the domestic things that's where that comes from back when men used to be well people used to be paid enough to where one salary could actually run a household and the other person could stay home and take care of all the other things right you know and you know i mean it there's now both genders are are working they have to be and you know and then you've got your kid going to like daycare and i do think that is uh kind of unfortunate i think i'm not saying that men have to go out and have the quote unquote real jobs of women should stay at home but I do think having a parent at home is a good thing it's a yes you know but it doesn't necessarily have to be the, the mom but the it doesn't have to be the mom like I mean I, I read like five six years ago for a while stay at home dad started to become a that's thing. A, that that emerged and it, it, it and that sounds like I'm a all fun job that. <laughs> I was like yeah <laughs> I can yeah. hear my baby I, around I watched my diapers. two little godsons and like right now that I'm not I haven't been working you know, I help, you know, babysit them. And it's like, man, I could be a house husband. Yeah. I, like, well, I love I, to cook. <laughs> I, it's fun. We watch Toy Story and then we do stuff. By and default, and I'm a house husband. Uh, you know, yeah. like when I was with my ex, yeah. I, I had a comedy career and I was always working. And yeah. then even now in the pandemic, my son stays home and I clean the house. And, you know, and like for me, I think like almost it's it's better this way yeah. because I, I don't know what women were complaining about being housewives back then when they would be like, I'm alone all day and eating mama. Feeding from right. And they're like, oh, this is, you don't understand how hard this really is. Yeah. And maybe it is, but it's like, I find cleaning therapeutic. Right. Yeah. And then I do all my cleaning and everything by the beginning of the day and the rest of the day, I'm, I'm fine. You know, I'm I, fucking, I think it yeah. gets more challenging the more kids you got. Like that's the other thing is I only have one it, kid. If your husband beats the shit out of you, like yeah, your right. wife beats the, the shit out of you, or like you know, I was like, always like, man, this is like fucking. <laughs> it's so funny. I don't know, bro. I have a dick, so I could jerk off if I'm bored. You know what I mean? Like I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Like I just like don't feel <laughs> bored at home. I'm never bored. I'm never with like my girlfriend works all day and she comes home and i'm like i've been alone you know like i'm like <laughs> you know and sometimes she's like i feel bad that i'm out all the time and i'm like i don't like i'm happy when i see you you yeah. know like yeah hey I, I i wanted to ask you as a parent dude like um like do, does your kid watch you perform yes he has he's, he has. he's been he's been on the road with me uncensored like Uncensored. Oh, wow. Oh, nothing censored at the house. Oh, yeah. really? Okay. Like, we talk about... That's, like, that's the interesting. I have a roommate, and he's not a comic. So, and he's a he's a working-class human being. He, mm-hmm. He's in the trades. Um, so he has a lot of dumb dad jokes about sexual innuendos, a lot of that's-what-she-said stuff. And yeah. like, oh, yeah. 
<laughs> none of that gets censored around my son. Okay. Mm. None of that's like, hey, man, my kids here don't curse yeah, or yeah, don't. Yeah. Like, you know, if we're watching a TV, a movie, and it's rated R and it's cut scene with some fucking titties in yeah. it, you know? It's <laughs> like, my son will get uncomfortable, but I, I don't. I'm like, that's... You're going to get to suck on one of those one day. You know what I mean? You play your if cards. If you want. Right. If you want. If you want. You don't have to. You can suck on something else. But, no, you know, I like. You. It, That's yeah. another thing, too. Uh, the homosexual, like, you know, when kids come out and they have to hide it. I've seen that a lot. I hope family. my son does not fear that. I yeah. hope he doesn't, if yeah. that's a thing. Um, I've seen the way he looks at titties, so I'm pretty sure he's straight. But <laughs> you can't I hide that. reminds him of his old food source, though. Right. <laughs> well, he didn't, yeah, yeah, maybe. I think that's what it is for most of us. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, but, you're right. But... But Freud would agree. The, I think that's why men are always looking yeah. in the refrigerator. We're just waiting for that titty to pop up. You know, like uh, that billion dollar idea, a bottle of yeah. bottle yeah. shit. the bottle of milk bottles. God. But I, yeah, I don't censor. I mean, obviously, like there's no porn around my kid, and I don't sure. blow weed smoke in his face. But <clears throat> he knows that I smoke weed. He yeah. knows that um, I get on stage and talk about being a dad. He knows that I. You know, like, I talk about fucking. He knows yeah, that I, you yeah. know, it's like, you're going to learn one day, and if you're sitting there curious, you're going to make a lot of mistakes. But if sure. you see your dad make the mistakes that he's making, you know, my son also sees me fall flat on my face. My son sees how poor I am. Right. My son sees, you know, like, um, you know, the the trials and tribulations that I've been through. He's, you know, he's watched me be in a, in a, in a abusive relationship with someone, mm. you know, and, and people go, you don't protect your son from that. And it's like, what are you protecting your kids from? Exactly. Like what trauma? Yeah. Because I fucking, I'm chock full of trauma. And I know people who are far more successful than me that are chock full of trauma. Mm. Sure. You know, trauma is it good? No, I don't think so. But does it help you learn to not fuck up in life? Fuck yeah. I mean, if Michael Jackson is <laughs> is anything else but a great example for this, Joe Jackson pretty much proved to us that you can beat your kids to success with enough trauma. Right. Just, just don't beat them too much to the point to where they get to touch another people's children. Well, yeah, and that's <laughs> the thing is that even if like, because yeah. I think I, I'm I'm yeah. in agreement, so it's, I'm not an I'm not a non Michael Jackson did this kind of person right, right but even if you take away that he touched children look how fucked up he was as a human being yeah yeah like yeah. what if if he didn't touch kids which I think he did but even if he didn't the motherfucker was trying hard as fuck to be white he was weird as fuck I don't give a fuck when people are like oh he's just a kid inside no when you're that fucking juvenile inside of you like I'm a kid inside yeah I'm a 15 year old I like to leave the sink on and clog it up or fucking throw fucking spitballs at people while we're sitting around I like to dick around but yeah but Mike's eight <laughs> yeah I'm not exactly <laughs> so when you're that stuck into your youth then something happened something was wrong and and I don't you know and again it's like you know for me man like I tell my kid because like he came to me one time he fucked up in school on a on a project and I go look here's the thing I ain't never going to yell at you for having bad grades. Mm -hmm. You're never going to get in trouble for having bad grades. Do the best you can. If I find out you're being lazy, if I find out you didn't do what you're supposed to do, then you're going to be in trouble. If you mm -hmm. didn't finish a homework assignment, you're going to be in trouble. Yep. If your homework assignment's wrong, that's not a problem. We'll fix it. We'll correct it. For sure. Or you'll take the grade, and we'll figure out what yeah, to do next better. time. Yep. But I'm not going to torture you over academics. I'm not going to push you to be successful. You're going to have to find success in your own life. I set the example here. You know, you yeah. see dad working hard. You see dad wanting to be successful. That should drive you to be successful. Opposite of being a tiger mom. I can't beat it into you. <laughs> What's a tiger mom, by the oh, way? Oh, it's a... Um, <laughs> okay, so I, 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 I work as a, a tutor, right? And, uh, well, I mean, I don't even have to bring it in that context. So a tiger mom is a, uh, for listeners out here, I, I don't mean to push a racial stereotype, but it's a racial stereotype among uh, Asian, particularly Chinese parents, where the mom really pushes their kids to be academically amazing. And if I could, I, uh, just yes. to give you a, a, an example, there's a show called Fresh Off the Boat. And I have a, an Asian friend, we were watching the show together, and she was like, wow, that scene is spot on. It's set in the 90s, and it's about... Uh, first generation Asian immigrants and then they've got their kids who were born first generation American Chinese and the kids are in like elementary school up to middle 
So the elementary school kids are getting their report cards, and all the children of other ethnicities are coming home with, like, C pluses and stuff, and they're getting rewarded with, like, oh, here's a basketball hoop in the backyard. Here's a new toy. However, the, the Asian kid, who this story is mainly about, his mother is disappointed because her son has all A's and she's complaining to the principal like your school isn't challenging enough because he has all perfect right like and I and I have students at, at one of my other jobs that just get this sense where like they come to me I had a kid uh, who was really really stressed because they they had all A's but they had a B plus yeah they were afraid nah. their mom was going to be so disappointed in them that's tiger momming and it's like I, nah, man. Can like, you, you know imagine what I mean? that? That's yeah, heartbreaking. Sure. I, I, like, you know how many kids would kill to have your grades and you sit right. over stressing yeah. over a B plus? Right. Out of all A pluses? Getting a D was a success for me at one point. <laughs> <laughs> getting C's. <laughs> C's. I remember getting C's so I could make wrestling the wrestling team. Yeah. Only year I made the team because wow. of the grades. And my parents were like, they wanted to throw me a party. Meanwhile, my sister's making honor roll and they're mad at her. <laughs> For getting a B plus, like you wow. said, and it's things are relevant, man. Things are fucking relevant. Like you know, the thing that helps my kid and and probably me with that kind of stress is that I also don't think, I think school's important. I think you should go, and I think you should finish. Mm. And if you want, you can go to college, but school's not the end all be all of your success. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And 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 again, we talk about constructs today. Uh, the whole education system is a fucking construct. It is. Yeah. It, it, you know, the to whole... Degree. Uh, the, yeah, and like, I mean, I, I use some of the stuff that I learned in school in my everyday life, but, uh, you know, I, I, I don't most of it. My girlfriend's a math teacher, and she'll tell you 90% of this curriculum is unusable in, in real life. Unless you're going... Unless you're a math te- Unless you're like a scientist person or an engineer and or using computer code or right and and so for me man it's like do your best yeah but where everything's gonna count is your is your overall work ethic right. is your mm-hmm. overall mm-hmm. attitude towards life you know i know um i know people who for example my roommate um i don't know what his success level in school was um, and I don't know what he uses, but he's an install. He installs um, uh, 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 lights. No, uh, uh, the shit goes between walls. That pink stuff. Oh, insulation. Insulation. Yeah. He's an insulation installer. Makes great money. Yeah. I think he makes like seventy k a year or something doing nice. that shit. Yeah. Um, and it's mundane work. You go in every day. You fucking staple a bunch of shit. You fucking coat the wall, and it's like you know. And like he's told me about his job. He is one of the most happiest people I've ever known. Mm-hmm. And, his, and his success doesn't come from his money because he's my roommate. Obviously, he's a roommate of a fucking comedian. He's not that successful. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like his money goes in there, but he owns a house in Vegas and stuff. But his happiness doesn't come from what he does and it doesn't come from what he owns. His happiness comes from his own inner being, how he feels about himself, how he feels about the world in front of him. You know, I think one of the things that we forget all the time is that it's not... You know, like, I don't see, I see you guys, Mm -hmm. but I'm not really seeing you guys. I'm seeing the version of inside me of what you guys are are seeing. You know, like, when I get a hug from someone, I'm not necessarily feeling their hug. I'm feeling that hug from the inside of me. Right, yeah. You know, so everything that happens in this world is up to how you interpret it. You know, like you could always look at a bad situation and go, this is bad. Or you could find your perspective on it and, and, and resituate your perspective and go, is it bad or am I learning a good lesson here? There you go. That is a good, uh, like that is for me important because I struggled with that for a long time where I felt because I didn't have a college education, like I wasn't enough. And, and, you know, and it's a construct, like you said, and I still struggle with that. Like, oh, man. You know, I went from being paid this to now this, and I, I, it, it fucks me up. Fucks and you up. It fucks me up. To but think look about at you, that. bro. You're sitting here. You got a team of people. You know, this guy doesn't even say nothing. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I'm pushing all the buttons. <laughs> exactly. I know you're pushing all the buttons, but that's what I'm pointing out, though, is that you have someone here. Yeah. Who's willing to sit down. Yeah. And follow you into this fucking hellhole called entertainment. Yeah. And he's not even like blinking. Yeah. That shows a level. You have two people that are willing to be with you in this endeavor. That's true. And that's yeah. more success. I-, I know guys who have tons of money and are alone in this world. You know, and that's yes. the thing, man, yeah. is like, 
you didn't go to college. I didn't go to college. In fact, honestly, I shouldn't. Uh, there's part of me that always wants to sue my high school because I didn't get a proper. I graduated, but I graduated because my mom wouldn't let them kick me out of school. And so they had no choice but to graduate me to get me out of their school because I was a troublemaker. I was getting in fights. I was right. fucking playing tricks on teachers. I was lighting fires. I was causing problems that nobody could do anything about. My mom was like, if you kick him out of your school, I'll fucking sue you. Wow. So they graduated me way, way under the par level. Like, I took good enough tests just to get out of there. And and so I don't know long division. I don't, you know, like I don't know statistics. I don't know algebra. Uh, I don't. I mean, if you've seen my posts, I don't know how to spell to say like I have a third, fourth grade spelling level. Hmm. Okay, but uh, w once again, I've or, I've been to Japan I've yeah. j on the on the government's dime to perform for the military. I I just did a weekend with a famous comedian. So I had to have been doing something right. right. You know what I'm saying? And yeah. it's like, you can't call me a loser. You can't call me, you know, you can look at my house and you can look at my car and be like, that guy's probably a loser, but you have no idea what I've done. How happy, Amen you, how happy you are, too. And how happy I am. That's what I started to see more. Like, man, I know guys who had stuff I want and or have the stuff that they want, but there's like, they don't seem happy. And some of these guys that I've seen, like, oh, this just... I think now, back in when I was younger, I want to be successful. I want to be successful. There's now I just want to be happy, man. Like that's my and goal. That's that success. Yeah. Yeah. But see, that's success yeah. because you could have millions of dollars and be miserable. And be miserable because we've seen it and we know it. But Donald Trump. Yeah. Despite whatever he is, is miserable. You I know why he's, he's miserable? Crazy. Not because crazy. he's broke, not because yeah. of whatever, but because he's worried about what other people think about him. Yeah. All the time. And that's it. He's worried about what they're saying about him. He's got... And to me, like, that's the thing, man, is like, fucking, I don't ever want to be like that, bro. Mm. I don't ever, like... I already think I'm a loser. I don't need <laughs> anybody else to call me a loser. I don't need to believe I can that destroy you myself. Already. Yeah, I'm already I'm Nothing already my worst say. enemy. Yeah. So I don't need any more enemies. Yeah. Because I have to battle the inside of me constantly. So if I give in to what you think or what you think or what m fucking my uncle thinks or you know, then I'm doomed. I'm doomed because I'm already losing half the battle to myself. For sure. So yeah. I constantly yeah. have to fight that inner battle and not give a fuck what anybody says. I have to tell myself all the time, like, you didn't fail, bro. You didn't fail. In, in fact, you've succeeded because you're doing so. I see these two guys, the Jarvis brothers, that I went to high school with. They took over their father's million-dollar business. They're millionaires. They're millionaires when they were born, and they're millionaires now. And I see them on the road from time to time. Great guys, dude. Two coolest motherfuckers I ever met. And when they see me, I'm always happy and we give hugs. And then they want to know what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. I honestly don't even know what their business is because I'm not interested in it. Yeah. You know, but they want to know what I'm doing. And I, one day I was like, why are you guys concerned? We went out to dinner one time. We saw each other in Tahoe or somewhere. And uh, I go, why are you guys so concerned about what I'm doing? Like... I mean, you guys, I see you traveling all over the world, and they go, you know, and they're like, yeah, but it's so cool what you do. Yeah. You know, and it wasn't a philosophical discussion, but you could break it down ph philosophically wise as far as like, they're not happy with what they're doing. Right. They're content with what they're doing, and that's cool. Contentment it, is great. But it doesn't bring them joy. But it doesn't like, bring them joy. And they're, that's why people come to our shows. Right. Yeah. They go back to a nicer hotel room. They have a rental car waiting for them. They could fly back first class. I take fucking Uber. I go back to the motel, not the hotel. Yeah. And I got to fly fucking um, uh, a Spirit to, to, to fucking <laughs> Vegas this week. Or, you know, yeah, and it's right. like I got to get on Southwest and see what kind of points I use. You know, like I got to fucking wrestle for a position on the plane and I got to like... You know, oh, fuck, dude. Yeah. Uh, how much longer can I ride on the donut on my car? <laughs> you know, and it's like, uh, but but am I more successful than they are? Fuck yeah, I'm more successful. Because there's a smile on my face when I go to bed in my fucking two-bedroom tenement. Guilt. 
And you don't yeah. have any kind of weird guilt that you do. Bro, they to the have top. a bigger house than me. I have a house that has a wall heater and, and a slumlord that controls everything. But you know what, bro? I've been, I've done lived outside. I've done lived under, under fucking bridges and fucking abandoned YMCAs, dude. Yeah. I'm happy with what I have. If you are walking through the forest naked, cold, and hungry, and I open a door, yeah. and then you come upon a little cabin in the in the woods and it's snowing and you're freezing and you're cold and i open that door and i let you in and i give you some soup i give you some warm clothes and i give you a place to put your head down for the night you're gonna be fucking happy but if you stay there for three four months you're gonna be like i need a bigger place i need to get out that's just our 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 inner human need to get bigger you know Mm -hmm. i'm i listen to this guy sad guru i don't know if you guys know who he is but he says if i give you a 10 by 10 space and I give you a bed and some food and a place to cook and a place to clean yourself, eventually you're not going to be happy with that space. And when I give you 20 by 20 space, you're going to be, you know, so much happier with that space. But after a while, you're going to get sick of that space. So I constantly tell myself to go back to that 10 by 10 space. I constantly tell myself to go back to when you had nothing, when you had no outlook on life, when you had no one to love, when you had no one loving you. And so when I look at my life now, I have a beautiful girlfriend who loves me. I have fucking wonderful friends like you guys. Um, I have a son who looks up to me. Um, I have a career where some of the top people in, in, in my business think that I'm, I'm good. They mention you. They in mention me. Podcasts, yeah, yeah, dude, like I, I'm on top of the world. I'm yeah. the king of my own world. Yeah, yeah. I don't need to be the king of anybody else's world because as far as I'm concerned, in this life, it was where I'm at. I'm at the top of what Butch has done in, in all of Butch's history. Mm-hmm. And that's all I need to be happy about. And as long as I'm progressing upwards and upwards and upwards, I no longer look at my, like my neighbor you know, and go, what is he doing? Where is he, why is he getting that show? Why did he why, get a new car? Yeah, yeah, why did he get that car? Yeah. Look at why did he get on that, that TV show or whatever, you know what I mean? Like if I see JD, all of a sudden the voice party does really big things and his career boosts and he's doing stand-up and he's performing all over the world and I'm still over at fucking uh, Joe's fucking wash land or whatever the fuck I'm performing at, <laughs> I'm still going to be happy. One, I'm going to be yeah. happy for my fucking friend because yeah. he found himself over the, oh, got himself over the wall. And two, I'm going to be happy because if he could do it, then I could do it. For sure. But the last thing I'm going to be is jealous and upset because you know why I'm not in JD's world. JD's may be at the top of his world, but he's not the top of my world. I'm at the top of my world. And so that's the thing, man, is that I think people need to stop looking around them and seeing what other people have and look at what you have. Especially right now in this fucking age where we're like, I don't have to wear a mask. Why do I have to do this? Why can't I do that? I need as much toilet paper as fucking possible because it might run out selfish thinking selfish thinking it's constantly like you know uh, like fucking you know I, I don't have like that's the thing man is people are losing their jobs and it's a funny time for me because I've lived under the poverty line my whole life mm-hmm. the government's given me 300 extra dollars on top of my 200 dollars of unemployment mm-hmm. I make 500 dollars a week now I'm making more money than I've ever made as a fucking comic because of the government wow right so when i'm sitting here saying i'm happy in the pandemic because i'm making money i'm getting time to be with my kid i'm getting time to be on t on you do my own podcast and play my own video games and do my twitch you know people and i go why are you guys mad why is everybody still mad that the world hasn't opened up because i'm losing i had a five bedroom house and now we're down to three bedrooms i had a fucking brand new camaro and now i'm driving down a a, a used caprice that i bought at a a police auction but you're still driving a car but you still have a house you're still eating food eating food you haven't lost you lost your you lost your fucking comforts and those comforts were only important to you because it's it identified with your status for sure you yeah. know, because I live in a two-bedroom tenement with my girlfriend, my son, two other roommates from Mexico. You could literally be like, you guys are on top of each other. It doesn't look comfortable. It's very comfortable because I love my roommates. I love my girl. I love my son. We're and very happy enough. to be in the same room together. Yeah. We take, you know, when someone goes into the bathroom to use it for the shower, they goes, anybody need to take a leak? Because it's the only bathroom we have. We've learned to deal. So when everybody else is suffering in this pandemic and they're like, I'm losing all my stuff and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, not me. Not me. I have more now. 
Yeah, that's one thing I um, I, it's funny as you were describing. You, I love my roommates. I love my girlfriend. I love my son. We're a family unit. This is a little off topic, but I'm like, this is a sitcom pitch. Like Netflix, Hulu, whoever's listening. Yeah. <laughs> Bar, Butch and, Escobar. And the apartments. Right. Sit, pick it up tomorrow. Yeah. That's, and that's one thing I'll say about sitcom families is no matter how little or how much they had, they were always happy to be there. Yep. Man, look at Sanford and Son, bro. And yeah. Son. Look how much that was Good a times. blast to be a part of when you watched it. Yeah. You know, like... Um, look at the Brady Bunch, dude. Those kids were on top of each other. <laughs> Even that house was huge. They still, and it still wasn't they were room. still forced to be with each other. Yeah, you know, dude. and it was like that's the thing is like it doesn't matter, bro. Like, I I like your whole take on this because it's like just look at what you have and it's enough. It should be enough. It should be enough, and I think that's a man. That's a, that, I think that's like the the main topic. We started where you were like. I feel like a fr- like you're not like a fraud, but I don't feel like enough. But then when you analyze, it's like you do therapy on yourself. Like, <laughs> that's exactly. I love this. I am yeah, the king. But that's what I go through every day. I wake yeah. up every morning, going, "Oh, dude, yeah. I made so many bad decisions to be here." And then my, but but the whole day is changing my psyche, changing my perspective. For sure. You know, but but by the end of the day, I get to hug my kid and I get to love my family and I get to like appreciate the things that i have you know like there's people right now in hospitals yeah struggling to breathe again i go back to this sad guru dude right yeah he goes what who's your god right now you know like if, if it's god if it's jesus christ if it's these things if it's this person that can create miracles then you want unattainable things right so you want the are not unattainable things but you want miracles to happen he was basically saying your god is what you need if God's the most important thing to you and I fucking sell your mouth and nose shut, is God still the most important thing to you or is breathing the most important thing to you? If I take away air, is God still important? Are you still going to be praying or are you going to be hoping for breath? Because once you start to breathe, and that's what he's saying is basically if you can't breathe, breathing's your your God. If you can't mm. eat, food is your God. You know, if you go to a lot of poor countries, they surround their gods with food. Yeah. You know, and, and that's the thing is like, to me, my God is contentment, is being happy, because I've been uh, I've been without contentment for so long, and now I'm content. You know, like yeah, do I want more? Do I want to go for more? For sure, you know. But I'm so grateful that I have a place to live. I'm so grateful because I didn't have those things before. Yeah. I didn't have love in my life. I didn't have a girlfriend who I was truly in love with. But I wanted those things. I wanted those things so bad. And if I look at what I have now and go, well, I'm not happy. You know, I want more. Go Always go for more. But look at what you got right now and be thankful. You know, I was on the plane coming home the other day and this baby was screaming his fucking head off. And people were losing it. They were getting upset. They were st- staring dirty looks at the poor woman with his kid. And the kid was fucking annoying, yeah. bro. Like, my first instinct was to punt that motherfucker right <laughs> off the plane. Oh. But what I did was I closed my eyes and imagined myself deaf. That I woke up deaf tomorrow. And I don't know if you've ever been to jail. No. But if you ever been to jail, bro, they don't feed you for the first six or seven hours. They're processing you. Oh, yeah. When and so by the time so, you yeah. get those cheese chokers, we call them cheese chokers. They're just bread and, and government cheese. Mm-hmm. It's a fucking gourmet meal. And then if you've been in jail for a very long time, you get out, you have some Taco Bell, bro. Oh, my <laughs> God. Oh, my God. And, and, and that's the thing, man, is I remember being in jail, and I remember getting out, and I remember the first thing I wanted was some fast food and getting it, and it was amazing. And then I remember a month later being sick of fast food. It's kind of like how when Tony Stark came out of that cave yeah, in the first Iron Man burger, movie, the first thing he wanted was a was a cheese. How good was that burger watching him eat <laughs> yeah, that? Exactly. <laughs> so that's the thing. That's what I'm saying to you, man. Is like, yeah, I always want more. I always yeah. want that 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 gourmet this meal. This is your closing statement, man. Say, give it to me. 
Oh, now you put me on the spot. <laughs> no, man. What I'm saying is, is never forget the times you were in need. Never forget the times that you were hungry. Never forget the times that you lost so much. If you're listening to this right now and you're like, I've never had any of those times, then go out and fuck up really bad. <laughs> go out and go to jail. Go out and yeah, fucking sit yeah. outside the house for a night. Try to stay the night on a yeah. bench, sleeping on a bench. Mm. And so much of your life, like, dude, all of a sudden you'll appreciate clean socks. A all small the, bed. Yeah, all the pre- all of a sudden you'll appreciate a sweater and a jacket. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, like like um, I read this part in The Alchemist where he was like, it was hot and he was like, he was holding his jacket and he hated that he had to hold his jacket while he was trying to get things done. But mm-hmm. when he started to get rid of his jacket and put it down for someone else to find, he realized when it gets cold, I'm going to need my jacket yeah. and I'm not going to be so burdened by it. And I think that's that's what I'm going to say here in closing is like, be appreciative for what you have because you can be completely without. You look around you, you see tent cities everywhere. You yeah. see the housing crisis. Especially in Berkeley. Like yeah, and so when people are like, what do you, oh my God, you pay this much or that? And it's like, dude, I have a tiny ass room that I pay 900 bucks for, you know, in a $2,450 house, a two bedroom apartment. I'm so happy I have that, bro. I'm so happy that I have that. And am I going to get more? Hopefully. But I don't care if I do. It's enough for now. It's enough yeah. for now. And then if that's all you have for the rest of your life, that's good. That's, that's okay. That's so good, bro. Good. That's Better I'm than further than along than I thought I was going to be when I was 18. Amen to that, man. Butch, thanks again. We've, Thank we've, we've you been for having this me. for over an hour. I don't want to take too much of your day. Where can people follow you, listen to your stuff, and uh, have you any upcoming shows? Follow me on Instagram. Um, at Butch Escobar and uh, on Twitch, Butch Escobar. Again, thank you guys for listening. That's been the Voice Party. We are out. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh